Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to have back on the show, Ron Danette. Ron, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me again. Yeah, so you are kind of infamous in the drum world. I mean, you are um, Danette Classic Drums, George Way Drums, and what we're here to talk about today, Milestone Percussion. Uh, congrats on acquiring that, that great Canadian brand. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, I've done an episode on Tempest, which sort of goes, you know, that's Milestone basically, I guess, turned into Tempest uh, in a way, which I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about there. But um, this is a pretty new acquisition. And I know uh, I just you're the kind of guy where when you post something or say something online like this, it's it's always something cool and special. You've got a certain way about yourself of presenting things. It's it's exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I. I guess that's my personality coming out. <laughs> I know uh, there's some people who might not always go along with that, but um, hey, I lead with my heart. I know where it's coming from. So um, yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone out there can can deny that uh, everything you put out really that I've seen is quality. I mean, you are a very attention um, to detail kind of guy, and I think that. Um, there's no denying that between the George Way drums, which are just gorgeous, and your own, the Danette drums, and now Milestone. The secret to that is making sure that even your mistakes are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I'm sure we will learn a lot from you as we go about your uh, your just your branding and all that is, is I think, very um, uh, in the photography and the graphic design, I know is really a passion of yours, and and uh, there's a lot there to cover. But what is the history of Milestone Percussion? Well, I am going to give you the history of Milestone Percussion as as I know it right now. Sure, because um, you know with this acquisition, and I have to say, um, I've been learning a lot, and. Um, from my standpoint, when when the milestone story starts is when I was a, a, a young drummer in the early 80s, like anybody, any child or, or, or musician in the, uh, in the 70s or 80s, we were catalog kids and uh, we didn't have the internet. So anything that we learned or knew or, or discovered was not through a computer screen. It was by going to a local drum shop or reading Modern Drummer or a magazine or looking at a catalog. That's, or by word of mouth. And as someone who's <laughs> a kid in the Midwest, let me tell you, there was limited access to that stuff. And so um, my earliest and fondest memory was uh, a another drummer uh, who was my age, uh, a, a good drummer. In fact, I was a little bit envious of him because I thought he was maybe a little bit better than me. <laughs> well, uh, he had a set of milestones. And um, I just remember walking in and seeing him playing them. I'm like going, wow, those look really cool and they sound really cool. And um, and so, yeah, I got behind him and of course, you know, it was it was the days of power toms and bass drums and pinstripe heads, but you know, <laughs> if you ever want to hear a drum set that sounds great, it's it's a set of of milestones with pinstripes, mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. fly ends on it. That's good to know. I mean, was it <clears throat> so? Milestone is not as much of like it's like a household name as like Ludwig or Gretsch. It kind of has its own special category, which there's a lot of uh, great brands that are 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 like that that are like in the drummer world, they're like really hold a special place in people's hearts. What was the like, I mean, kind of more on the history of milestone. What was really the heyday of what were the, the dates that we're talking about here with, with milestone being in existence, you know, in its original form, I'm going to call it the Clapham era. That seems to be, everybody wants to, somebody laid that, laid that label on me today. Hmm. And, um, you know, talking about, learning as we go, I've started to learn more and more about um, who Michael Clapham was. I never actually met him. Uh, I only know him through name, but um, some of that information has been coming out through, uh, you know, his family and his estate. And um, so I, I, I would say that I think it was 11 or 12 years that Michael was actually making those and, and 
and uh, um, you know gone through the the prototyping stage and R and D and finding all of these formulas, these things that I'm starting to learn. Sure. And so to answer your question, it has to be any time, you know, as long as he was at the helm of that company, I, I have not, I've yet to see a kit that he made that was not, um, was anything less than perfect. Hmm. Now, do you know, so Michael Clapham, like you said, founder of the company, was, was he a, um, was he like, I always like to ask that question though, of like, did he come from like a like a manufacturing background that you know or i mean how do you get into making these kind i'm just because they're 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 all fiberglass right they are yeah and and my my knowledge of that part of the history um isn't as good as it needs to be and like i said that's part of the this whole process is is learning about that but i do know that uh michael sort of got his start he was working at uh I believe it was uh, Drum Village here in Vancouver, which was a local retail store. Now that would have been in the seventies. Okay. Um, and he eventually um, partnered up and took over that retail operation. And Ray Ott was involved there at some point. And um, which he only, <laughs> that name always pops up, doesn't it? Yeah. And um, at at some point. Uh, Michael and there was somebody else and their name escapes me, but it was, Michael was the driving force uh, behind it as, as I understand it. And they began this development on making fiberglass drums. Now they certainly weren't the first to do it, but I do think that the process that they came up with at the time was, was, uh, was pretty unique. And Mm. so um, I, Knowing what I know about research and development in the musical instrument uh, field and sort of drawing a line back to them, uh, I can kind of see where they were, um, you know, that development of different formulas and figuring out, okay, well, what thickness do we need for a drum shell or a tom shell or a snare drum? Sure. And, uh, um, so and eventually, Michael, uh, again, my understanding is that he sold his interest in that drum shop. And I believe that was right at the time that Ray started drum zone. Now I may have, I may not be a hundred percent correct on that. It's, you know, I, I think that's, that's academic, but that's my understanding. Well, and, and I need to, so people can listen back also the Tempest episode with Paul Mason. I think he covered a fair amount of the history of, you know, or, or at least gave an overview of it, which is worth checking out to kind of, uh, I like doing episodes like this. Like there's, there's ones on fives where all the iterations of fives, I think have been covered in all of their different, uh, you know, uh, forms in other episodes. Um, so this is kind of neat to do this with, with these drums. Um, and actually Ray Ayot, I actually sent him a, um, Facebook message recently, and I haven't heard back, but he's one, he's a person I have to get on the show. I've never met him or talked to him, and I don't think he's accepted the, you know, invite, but um, that's a company as well that I think needs to be uh, covered, because like you said, there's a ton of history there. <laughs> Make sure you roll it out as a, as a two-hour special. <laughs> really? A lot, a lot there? Yeah. Yeah. His name comes up a lot, like you said. Um, so... You have been working on acquiring this this brand, which which you know it's worth mentioning too, with George Way and and kind of acquiring, um, just the trademark of of these of these older brands. This is now number two for you with George Way, and you're doing this. Um, that's sort of a, a th- it's I mean it's a thing that you you do you know kind of save brands from being going into obscurity. You know that's that's something that Ron Danette does now. <laughs> Well, I certainly didn't know that that was going to be part of what I ended up, you know, and I, I'm not, I, I get where you're coming from on that. It, it was completely unintentional, sure. but I did come by it honestly because, yeah. you know. Um, it's a good thing. <laughs> it, it is. And, and, and growing up um, and, and learning about drums and, 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 you know, basically stumbling into this industry. Um, the things that you learn going through 
you know, I'm going to be 60 in June and I started playing when I was 15. So, um, and I'm, I'm lucky to say that I haven't lost my fascination with drums at all. In fact, I, there's a little bit of a, you know, a melancholy going on there. Just thinking about, um, I'm lucky to be able to remember that feeling of, of opening the catalogs and, and looking and, you know, fawning over, you know, Pearl and Ludwig catalogs and, um, yeah. And, and doing this actually kind of makes me feel a little bit like a kid again. And it's keeping me young. I hope that's yeah. Wow. What a great way to put it because, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're lucky where, where sometimes people will talk, you know, non drummers, just like friends and family friends will talk about something about like, um, I don't know with like their kids maybe about how they don't have like, you know, they don't know what they're going to do in school. Not that you have to go to school for drumming or they don't have this. Not everyone has this passion that we all share for drumming uh, for anything in life. They they sometimes people don't have an obsession like we all have. And uh, I think we're kind of lucky to to find something that's so like we will talk about drums for the next hour and then I'll probably be Googling something about the drums right after we get done and then annoy my wife talking about it at dinner. And it's like, we just can't get enough of it. I think about my son and I've never pushed him in any direction towards anything. I just really took a hands-off approach and, um, and by the same token, you know, nobody pushed me and I, I'm, I feel so fortunate to, um, you know, given my, my history growing up to have, um, landed here and, you know, nobody gave me any direction to, you know, Hey kid, play to your strengths and you'll be okay. You know, nobody ever gave me that. So yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky that, that fate has, you know, given me something to do that, um, you know, has afforded me a, a, a comfortable lifestyle. And yeah. Nobody did. Nobody gets rich making drums. I'm sorry. Just, you know, if you know it going in. Yeah. Uh, but it's been um, deeply satisfying. And I, I think I've said this before. It's, um, you know, the real wealth comes in the friends and the people that you meet and everything and all of, all of those takeaways. And I, uh, you know, I don't want that to sound trite. That's, that really is what marks uh, a career. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Ron, I think it'd be cool to talk about now. Um, just the, the process of acquiring milestone. Cause I think, um, nothing like that is ever easy. Like there's a lot of paperwork, I'm sure, and there's equipment and and just, just everything about it. When did it start? The whole process. How did that work for you? Uh, well, that's going to be a long story, <laughs> and I'm going to give I'm going to give you as much detail as needed. Sure. I um, this part of it, this part of the acquisition started uh, basically when. Paul Mason decided to shut it down. Now, Paul is a a, a dear friend. Um, I we've traveled the world together, um, and I love him dearly. But on a business side, uh, there was always things with Paul and his business model that I never completely understood. And if there's one thing that I've learned in this industry. I, I mentor a few builders that I think um, I see a little bit of myself in it. And I'm, I'm generally try to be a helpful person and, and try to encourage that. I always think that there's certainly room enough for, for, you know, new people to start and come and have new ideas and new visions. And, and I, I think that's great. The industry needs that. We need people to keep doing that. So Paul decided to pack it in. Um, which to me wasn't really surprising. I, um, you know, there was a lot of, shall we say, turmoil around Tempest and mm -hmm. um, it came down to issues of, you know, customer service and quality control and um, 
And I remember those well, because I mean, there was even a point in time when people were calling me because they knew that I, yeah, I, I can't get a hold of Paul. Like, like you're his friend. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's draw that line here. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, a group of investors and partners came together and we had an idea that we were, you know, Hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we, why don't we make an offer? Why don't we try and buy milestone from Paul? And, this seemed like a good idea. I thought, yeah, you know what? Um, I don't think that brand has, has been done. And I, more importantly, from a business sense, I, I really had to evaluate, was the Milestone brand in any way negatively impacted by its uh, implied association with Tempest? And um, I thought that there, was, that there was enough there that it could be salvaged. And so... Uh, I made an offer to Paul. I think this would have been about four or five years ago. And um, I don't know. I, I, I thought I was being very practical about it. And I, I said, Paul, I'd like to buy it from you. And I'm going to offer you this much money. And I'm not going to say how much it was. And, of course. Um, but I, I don't know if there was... <laughs> Must have been something about the way I said it. <laughs> I really still to this day don't completely understand it, but um, Paul kind of took offense and um, and uh, didn't speak to me for a couple of years. <laughs> I was like, I, I did. I really. I thought, what did I do? What did I, I was just trying to buy. It. And I guess it was because I, I in in that offer, I explained to him. I said, you know what? I'm offering you this much money because I I'm only we are only really interested in. Uh, the milestone brand, the Tempest thing is yours. And, um, you know, that, you know, goes with you kind of thing. And, you know, the, the discussion amongst the partners that I had at the time was that, um, you know, we can't have any involvement because there's just, there was so much negativity um, over, like I said, over the product and customer service and lack of communication. And, and yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. So, um, uh, just over a year ago, I'd say maybe a year and a half ago, I, I got in touch with one of those, um, partners again, and we were, we stay in touch and we were chatting and thought, you know, we should just, let's just do it again. Let's, let's just throw another offer out. And so we did. Um, and it was somewhat less than last time. And, um, uh, a couple of weeks after Paul came back and said, he made a counter offer, and part of the counter offer was that, um, in addition to more money than the initial offer, he would receive five percent of profits until he died. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, no, that's not going to happen," you know. And, and I realized he, he, he and and it, and it was part of the friendship coming in where I was going. I don't want to hurt my friend's feelings, but. It just you can't be involved you mm -hmm. know it's just, there's no that that can't happen and so um uh, i left it at that and i went well you know and he decided well it's just going to lay dormant then for you know and i thought wow it's just okay it's not my decision it's out of my control i've done everything i can and then it was shortly after that uh, somebody sent me uh, a, a post that something had Paul had posted on his social media, uh, which really took me aback. And it wasn't even a day or two later that I listened to your podcast <laughs> or it came to my attention. Sure. And I was listening and uh, surprise, surprise, Paul Mason had never owned or purchased um, the Milestone trademark. Hmm. As a matter of fact, and I have this here just because I thought, you know, this is, this is relevant. Um, someone asked Paul a question about Milestone, and he said, this is part of his quote, he said, I knew almost from the outset that I wouldn't be purchasing the Milestone brand name, as Michael Clapham wanted an unjustifiable sum of money for it at a time when, rather than it holding any goodwill value, it was rather more of a detriment than an asset because of the reputational damage which Michael's management had inflicted on the company. Suffice it to say, I was more than just a little disappointed um, 
not to have been given this information. And um, so I did my uh, I did my due diligence. I spoke to the people that I needed to, and uh, it became apparent to me that I could move forward and uh, appropriate, acquire the milestone trademarks um, in U.S. and Canada. And so I began that process. Who who owned, was that the Clapham fan, estate who, who still maintained the original trademark or who did you? To the best of my knowledge, uh, Michael Clapham never sold the trademark while he was alive. And so as it is with trademarks, and the laws are s- similar and different in the United States and Canada, mm-hmm. but after um, there's a certain criteria where a trademark is basically abandoned um, and, and becomes available. And as it was with George Way, the same thing. Uh, I did some research, um, you know, and discovered that the U.S. trademark for Milestone was abandoned actually a couple of years before Paul Mason even started Tempest. Hmm. And I also found out that, uh, uh, I think it was, it was later on than that, but possibly 93, that uh, the Milestone percussion trademark in Canada was expunged from the Canadian trademark register. And so a sufficient amount of time had passed that that was uh, leg- legitimately available for anyone to register and start a business. Wow. Man, that is a uh, lot of ups and downs there. And and I, I want to say, as you said, you are very good buddies with him. There's 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 like business stuff and then there's friendship. And I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Paul and I think he did a really good job on the episode. And um, I think you're being very factual. But I just want to say that as a person and everything. And and here we're just delivering the it's an episode about Milestone. But I just want to say, because I'm sure Paul is listening. Uh, he's a really nice guy. And I, I have. The, he's, a, the, he's, he's a beautiful man. I love him dearly. He's a very affable guy. Um, and like myself, he made a lot of friends in this industry, you know, in in his time in it. But, you know, I, I I'm, you know. Yeah. Good. That, yeah, that, this is a good thing. But w- when it comes to this, um, you know, I I just had to. Um, quite frankly, I still don't know what to think. Um, but I just decided to move past that and uh, do what I had always wanted to do, uh, which is not see milestone just drift into oblivion. Um, and I also wanted to see it uh, as I did with. With George Way, I saw the potential for, for this great, beloved uh, Canadian heritage brand to come back, and it has all kinds of potential. So, yeah. um, I'm I'm delighted. Yeah. Last thing on Paul, I I know that on on some level, someone's going to look at it and go, "Well, I was a shrewd move, Danette," and I'm like, <laughs> from a business standpoint, if I'm wearing that hat, it's like, what am I supposed to do? Um, I did my fair share of trying to explain, you know, I, I have a saying, you take care of business or business takes care of you. Yeah, and, that's good. Um, if you're going to be a businessman, you got to learn how to protect your, um, whatever it is that you're doing or whatever you want to do. And um, so I sat down, I had a meeting with Paul the day that the trademark cleared because um, being the friend that he was, I, I, as you can imagine, it was something that I felt that I needed to tell him in person, and I did. And um, I didn't know how he was going to react, but actually, he was uh, he was very calm. Hmm. And uh, you know, at the time, he said, "You know, I've always thought that if anybody could do anything with Milestone, it would be you." And, and that was that. Um, I think subsequently, I get the feeling that he 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 felt that the milestone thing was actually part of his legacy and that's where our our opinions on milestone diverged because um yeah as i said you know when i read that thing it's like no you know you rejected it out of hand for a number of reasons and you started your thing and that's yours this um i, I and i have to say 
the use of the trademark in that interim period between Michael Clapham and Ron Danette was, um, was cynical at best. Hmm. I don't think I saw anything that made me think it was a loved brand the way that I love it. And so, um, yeah. And so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you though, I, I feel like, and, and I think that a lot of people would think this, like, as you said, you're not getting, you know, becoming a millionaire doing the drum stuff. I think you, I get a very genuine sense with this and George way that like, you're really trying to keep these brands alive and keep them from just disappearing and do it for all the right reasons. And, yep. um, and maybe it, again, it's, it's part of your personality of like, you're just, you're going to do it no matter. I mean, things, some feelings might get hurt along the way, but I think the end result will be, um, uh, worth it. You know, you don't want anyone's feelings to ever be hurt or upset or hurt a friendship. But uh, like you said, sometimes you just have to do things that are I, I, uncomfortable. I really, had, I really had to weigh it against, you know, I sleep well at night. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a straight up, frank, honest business person. And I've always been good in my business dealings. And I pride myself in that, uh, in doing yep. that. And so um, I, I guess, you know, if I have to look at it this way, my... Uh, my desire to share and and rebuild this brand was greater than than you know any other consideration. Yeah, and, and I would do it again. I think that's uh, you. Like we've said a few times, you have a you are an, an individual, a unique individual in the drum world uh, because I think you've got this. Like I don't know. I, I feel like, and I'm not getting all like psychological here but you don't mind what i gather is you don't mind standing alone if you what you believe in is the right thing i think you'll move forward it's kind of the impression i get of you and i've always kind of admired is you 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 feel a certain way you'll do it and it doesn't matter really what happens so i think that's that's a great uh characteristic <laughs> yeah i know it's a blessing and a curse it really is <laughs> yeah you know it's like oh my god like do i really i mean come on think about it i've got two reasonably successful drum brands right now why am i doing this i'm i'm turning 60 and i'm actually trying to sort of you know wind down and and we talked about this on my segment divest a little bit like do you really want to do this do you know what you're taking on and it's like the elation the absolute joy of holding that that tangible manifestation of 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 who you are yeah and, and you know in your hand and and then sharing it with somebody with drummers and um you know and, that, and that's a great segue because i want to say one thing that always bothered me and and i i didn't it wasn't i didn't just hear it from paul but i've actually heard it from a, a, a couple other um something similar from other uh, manufacturers who work in composites is that it's always kind of a hard sell, you know, because drummers want wood drums and they're not really interested in anything new. And they, you know, and they, and I'm like, huh? Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I've, my stock and trade is making stuff that hasn't been done before. And yeah. I, completely disagree with any statements to that nature i think i think most drummers they're not going to turn their nose up at something that sounds good i certainly didn't the first time that i saw it i went these sound fantastic they look great i don't care what they're made of yeah i really don't what are they made out of uh you know recycled aluminum cans fantastic look at yeah you know? No, I don't think I think and, and but also like on that note, it's not like it's some brand new um, kind of just out of nowhere material. It's been around. You know what I mean? I mean, it's how Blaine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. With the spun fiberglass and which Blameyer will be a, a future Ar episode. Yeah. Arguably one of the most recorded drummers. You know, if, if you drive an hour today, you're probably going to hear a fiberglass drum. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I don't believe that. And, um, no, but 
I think I think drummers we like our heritage, we like our we love our history as we should because it's the most, you know, historical instrument out there, but we also like modern new stuff and we like seeing the the uh the inventions and the the repurposing of old stuff but i i think that is also a good transition to what are you going to be so you got it you 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 are milestone now what can we all look forward to now well you know that was one i'm glad you said that because there was one thing that i wanted to say um I, I, I was thinking about talking about the brand in the context of what we just discussed. And I think the brand, and I'm, I'm thinking of the brands themselves, they actually do have a personality and are, and are an entity uh, uh, unto themselves in a way that I'm, I'm not 100% able to articulate right now. Uh, I, I did want to mention that, that it's, they really are bigger than whoever owns them at the time. You know, we're just, I'm just a caretaker of everything, even, even the Danette brand, although I really don't want that, that brand to go forward without me, you know, um, yeah. I've been thinking about that, but. Yeah. Um, well, wait, expand on that a little more. Are you talking about how just like, let's say with, I mean, with, I, I know, I feel like I know what you mean. Where like, you know, these brands have like just beyond the people, beyond the, the players there's a feel to it there's like a history to it there's like like uh there's just like a i don't know there's like a style to it it's an it's an entity isn't it it's it's like it's it's, so i said personality it has you know it has a a birth date and a and a a, in some cases an expiration date or, or some cases not there's you know you know you look at like companies and all of that that graph of of like i called it you know that pageant of history where they had fell on super hard times, went through world wars, you know, and, and here they are in whatever iteration that they happen to be in. Um, yeah. And that's how I'm, I'm taking that vision of that forward. And um, I, th- I think it, I think it, it, it informs how I treat the company and, and the brands because I don't just see it as a drum or a product or a commodity. It's, yeah. it's so much more than that. Yeah. I don't want to say it's a lifestyle because that sounds like a buzzword kind of thing. But like it is like a like when someone pays, you know, a fair good amount of money for a drum set. I mean, you're really buying into the, like the culture of that, you know, what that brand. Oh, yes. It just it, it becomes a part of you. I would totally agree with that. And um, but so that being said, are you like manufacturing all this stuff what, what what's your plans with creating new milestone drums um i mean tooling up and getting fiberglass and all that i mean that's that's a whole thing but if anyone can do it it's you with it it, it was a process and um it went much <laughs> a few turns of events that i'm not going to talk about but i just kind of shake my head it's like i'm like going it really does go back to that old adage, like, hey, you take care of business or business is going to take care of you. And that's really, you know, what it boiled down to. But um, I'm so excited about it. Um, and I'll tell you about a couple of things. I mean, I, I was just answering some questions online the other day. But, but the first uh, step, other than uh, securing the uh, intellectual property, was um, creating a lug now. Um, because it's a fresh start, I had to create fresh tooling for the lug. And I have to say that one of the things that always bothered me about the original was that on the face of this lug, it had a little step that went around it. And I always thought it really destroyed the the beauty of that smooth, soft, those radius edges. And so when I recast it, everything is basically the same, but I got rid of that. Mm. And, um, And, you know, the the end result is like to an uneducated eye'd be like no that's a that's a milestone lug hmm. uh, but no this is completely different yeah and then of course there was the process of of getting the shells made and um that happened i thought that was going to be the biggest the biggest hurdle uh but it happened relatively quickly and uh, as you can see here i've got a completed shell and this is um uh, one of the first one of the first early prototype shells and um wow it's beautiful for for people listening ron's holding up a a beautiful silver sparkle it looks like uh 
milestone shell and and uh this is just a good time to tell people you can watch these on youtube and see these if you're listening uh and if you're on youtube then you're obviously watching it already but um so are you making those shells or you're you've partnered with a fiberglass kind of uh yep. company yeah someone someone who has uh expertise and experience in in this you know working with resins and fiberglass and um you know the, the, the fact is that just to get things rolling uh, you know, we came up with this formula, but I know that there are um, many, many other uh, formulas available, and I, and I know that from from you know learning the history of Michael Clapham that he had uh, a number of different formulas that he applied to snare drums, toms, and bass drums. And so uh, just to get things rolling, the introductory, you know, we're just going to roll out snare drums. Yep. And, uh, you know, with the blessing of the Clapham estate, um, I've been talking to uh, one of Michael's sons and um, we're starting with snare drums. Uh, just, yeah. just to kind of get things rolling and um, found the formula that we think works. Um, and we're going to call it, it's, it's going to be the founder's model. And uh, I'm just, in the process of developing what that model is actually going to be. But I, I really want to pay uh, homage to Michael Clapham, the founder. He did a great thing. He created a great Canadian brand and he deserves to have the credit uh, for that. And I figured what better way than to include his name on, you know, the initial snare drum offerings. Yeah. So what I have in front of me here now is um, uh, an example of that. Now, this is an old milestone badge. Uh, we don't, I don't have all of the components yet, but, uh, the badge for the first 100 snare drums, which is going to be the founder's model, uh, is going to be a minted badge. It's going to be about, uh, four to five millimeters thick, uh, chrome plated, and we'll have the milestone, that very beautiful, simplistic, uh, you know, famous yeah. milestone logo. Um, yeah. You know, maybe that's the other thing from, from a graphic design point, that's, this is yeah. this and is you got an awesome milestone shirt on, which I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's like, I mean, it, yeah, stuff can be very simple. Simple's good, you know, and also extreme uh, the the other end of it can be very cool too, with a lot of, you know, design, but simple is very good. Yeah. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. And, 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 you know, to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to Michael's credit, you know, going back and looking at some of the you know, uh, the original ads and, and, um, you know, the branding, it was always very clean and concise. And, and back at a time when we didn't have computers, I mean, he was doing, you know, I don't, I can't even imagine how difficult it was challenging to get, um, you know, everything that you needed together, just using a phone book and word of mouth. Oh yeah. Now, did you get, um, I mean, this is again kind of the technical stuff, but so you acquired the trademark of Milestone. I'm, it sounds like like tooling and machine stuff, like like sh old shells. Did anything come with that, or are you starting? You're just starting fresh. I'm starting from scratch, hmm. using um, and and you know what? I I had to do that with George Way because it's and and, and you have a starting point, and then I, I, the thing that I learned in, in trying to uh, stay true to the heritage and the look and feel is that, you know, for example, the George Way, the beer tap trough, I originally had those made exactly how he made them. And once I got them made, I realized this is not going to work. Hmm. And I have to change this. And so I changed that part, which was machine parts that screwed together into a single die cast piece. And vastly improved the functionality of it and you go well this isn't the same and i'm going if george had lived to be 100 years old and was still making drums who is to say that this isn't what he would have done it and you know um yeah in, in the same way that uh, george's spirit informs and guides me on my decisions that I make in the shop when it comes to his products and his designs. Uh, I, th I think also um, uh, Michael Clapham's spirit is going to uh, inform uh, and, and guide me in, in 
in the manufacture of milestone drums. And um, yeah. you know, frankly, I think Michael would be much happier knowing that the brand that he created was um, alive and making drummers happy and still making music yeah. as opposed to being, um, well, what it might have been. It's all about, I mean, really, the there's a lot of drum brands who who were around for about 10 years or so, and, and we like to dig deep into them here on the podcast, but like really for a 14-year-old drummer starting somewhere in you know, the Midwest, they wouldn't have heard of it. But now through social media and through you doing stuff like this, they get to know about these these older brands. Um, and, and it made me think, too, about your previous episode on the podcast you did about George Way, and we talked about that you know, acquisition a while back. Um, I remember you saying that where if things continued on, I don't think these, these inventors really George way and Michael Clapham would want, like you said, the development of a brand to just stop and then not, not move forward with technology just because they stopped working on it and passed away or stopped working with the company. Um, that doesn't mean it should have ended. So I think you're right to just push forward with technology and make them modern. Well, I, I always look at, um, and, you know, I, I can't help but think about it, you know, in the context of Milestone, when I think about, you know, uh, my my dear friend, Don Lombardi, um, and what uh, him and, uh, you know, what he did, you know, with Camco. And there's there's some distinct similarities there. You know, when he's when he started, he did the same thing that, that Mason did. He he bought the tooling. But. He didn't start Camco and he certainly didn't throw Camco under the bus for, you know, any reason. And he started his own brand and thank God for that. We wouldn't have DW drums and all of the great innovations that they've managed to, um, you know, acquire or put together. And Slingerland. I was thinking about the, the, the acquisition of Slingerland early on about how you're doing this. And it's you, you two are guys where I think uh, it's like, I don't know. It's like people can trust that it's going to be done right as opposed to, I don't know. I don't know a company that would do it wrong. I don't want to say anything like that, but um, it's kind of, <laughs> I <it's>, do. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> the world has confidence that you guys can, uh, can do it, you know? Well, we all, I mean, I, I don't have to name any names. We've all seen, you know, uh, what, ha what has happened with certain brands, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, Slingerland, because of, you know, in that interim period when they were, um, you know, with Gibson and, uh, and, and Henry that, you know, they, they languished there. And, you mm. know, at that time, you know, nobody was protecting the IP. And now, you know, you can buy, I can, I can pick up the phone right now and order a thousand beaver tail lugs. You know, there's no, yeah. and I can, do whatever I want with them. Not that I would, Sure, you know, and, and it breaks my heart when, you know, that in particular, I look at that beaver tail lug and I'm going, that's the most beautiful, beautiful art deco lug ever made. And it's become homogenized and generic mm. and bastardized. And that really breaks my heart. So, um, yeah, that's the big company. Uh, they're through doing so many of these episodes that there's the, the small, small ish company, going in being acquired by a big huge company and then that company after a couple of years says this isn't working out the way we thought it was let's get rid of it and then it just kind of trickle things just fall apart from there that's a pretty common tale um in the drum world you know it's it's sad yep yep and then you know i've seen some attempts to to bring certain brands back and they get it oh, yeah 90 percent. why did you why why did you <laughs> would have cost you nothing to do this right why don't you just you know especially hard for me to watch because the blueprint is right there you don't have to invent anything it's a bass drum spur you already know what it looks like on the original why 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 i don't anyway yeah it's so frustrating and yeah. again that's where i i just I, i've become much much better at um at being able to let that stuff go and, and just understanding that you know what i can't fix it all and yeah, because the stuff I can fix, I'm going to fix it how it needs to be. So. Yeah. And, you know, this is um, it's so, it's related to this in general and everything that you do. But um, I've, I've always kind of wondered this. Are, are you yourself like every either be it George Way or Danette or now Milestone? Obviously, with Milestone, you're getting help to build the shells because it's a 
different material, but do you work with a fair amount of other people in general on like assembly and, or when you buy a Danette, I mean, are you cranking out every drum yourself or what's that like? I mean, cause you're, you're one man, you know, Danette pays all of the bills for milestone and George way. Mm-hmm. And there is only one guy here building Danette drums and that's me. Yeah. Wow. And so, um, you know, and I, it is, it, it's it's become a real challenge. It used to be, it was it's it's always been a challenge, but it used to be a it, it was a different set of challenges when I was first starting out. Um, now it's become a matter of um, how thin can you slice a ron? <laughs> <And I'm, laughs> I'm pretty transparent right now, so yeah. Um, or you wish you could clone yourself. There's times like that with everyone when you're doing something where you're the one man band, kind of like with the podcast. I'm like, God, I wish I could just. Because it's hard to trust people to to take your baby and care about it as much as you do, as I'm sure you know, or have the skill to do it. And I've had, you know, does anybody out there want to come and work for me? Yeah, I know. I've had so many people come in the shop and they've been great. But the problem is this is this is a single car garage. That is the extent. The real factory is here. And um, I've had two things happen. First of all, um, the shop is so small to quote bugs bunny um uh, i have to go outside to change my mind so there's no place there's no place to put anybody yeah. in here and when i've had people help they're out on the driveway and um and that's great in the summertime and i've had times when i've had okay this is great I, you, thanks for coming to help you know that was 10 hours and then i go to look and it's like oh my god everything that this guy just put together was put together with the wrong size washer And so generally speaking, um, I spend more time helping the people that are here helping me than they spend helping me. So I've just resigned myself to the fact that I've just come to terms with the limitations of what I do and how I do it. And and I'm okay with that. And the people who sell my product, um, they're on board and they understand that, that um, I'm not trying to be the next mass production and I'm not at at a period of my life and will never be where I'm going to go out and get a big facility and start having a monthly nut to crack. And, uh, I'm not, yeah. It's not. Yeah. I've tried to get an intern for this stuff. Cause this is very good for like media people in school or like even business. It's like, let's work on growing YouTube to make more money or something. And one kid dropped out of college. Another kid stopped answering. Someone else was just like, really, really, they just didn't show up. And it's just like, man, it's hard. No one cares about your thing as much as you do. And uh, it's, it's well, tough. hey, I, I and and it, it, it's my turn to um to give you kudos because um I listen to your I, I listen to what you're doing. I oh, might not you. seem like I'm paying attention, but I do. And I think what you're doing is um I don't think that oral history um, is appreciated. I know that um, I've done something similar like this with with PAS, mm-hmm. and um, I think moving forward after I'm gone, um, that that this is uh, this is really important work that you're doing. So I hope Thank you, you continue to do it, and I hope it continues to uh, you know develop and 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 go through refinements because um, it, it it matters, and that's why I'm here doing it. Thank you. I'm I'm uh, talking about me is the most boring thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think people like to hear what you have to say, because, again, you you have kind of a uh, a personality where I think people trust you're going to speak your mind. Um, and I, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that very much. I mean, this is almost 150 episodes in. And um, and wow. on that note, I will say that uh, people listening to this should go back. Uh, there's kind of a George Way series that you did one on the the history of George Way uh, Rob Cook, I believe, has about two episodes that kind of fill in and supplement mm. um, some more information to really I think it's three episodes total that like really cover the history of George Way. And the best way I can tell people to find them is drumhistorypodcast.com on the episodes thing. There's a little search button. And if you type in George, it'll like search the context of the you know the description and then you'll find those three episodes yeah. um, pretty easily there. But I appreciate that, Ron. That means a lot coming yep. from you. And, and you've and you've had Jim Catalano on, right? Yes. Yeah. He's he's a, a national treasure. Yeah, and he he's the nicest guy in the world too. And he sends me messages 
frequently that'll just say like, "Hey, I loved this episode, by the way." Uh, yeah. Which we're we're all uh, at a, at a point. I mean, the podcast has been growing and it's been successful, which is awesome. But you're we're humans, and you're not impervious to someone saying, "Hey, good job, keep it up, kid." That's always nice, no matter how long you've been doing it. And I'm sure you yeah. feel the same way of someone saying, "Hey, Ron, these look great. You're doing a good thing. Keep going." Um, yeah. People like well, you to know what, that. I'm, and, and I'm sure you appreciate this as much as I love the compliments. Um, they're, they're they they only do one. They only serve my ego, which is pretty tiny and insignificant. But <laughs> it's it's the it's the you know I really like what you're doing, but and I'm that makes my ears go okay. But what? Yeah. Tell me because because I can't use. Um, I can't use the positive feedback other than other than to go. Okay, I, I, I'm I'm doing the right thing here. Sure, it, it's the I'd like to see this, or have you ever thought of this? And and ninety um, percent of the time, I'm like, yeah, I've been down that road. I've seen it, but gosh, there's it's nice when someone actually gives you something that you go, you know what? Um, damn, you're right. Yeah, honest feedback of yeah, yeah. Uh, constructive, you constructive. Know, yeah, well, criticism is awesome. It's it's so underrated, and people, you know, especially now on the internet, they just take. Yeah, you know, I guess, in the context of this conversation, I've I've really tried to give a, a lot of constructive, useful. Fe- I'm trying to help you. Yeah, <laughs> just trying to help you. Like, <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah. No, but I, I I also think that in in this world, which again, we're all what kind of connects all of us with drum builder, drum brand podcast. Now YouTube is we all use social media to expand and, and, and be the face of our brand. And, uh, I've learned a lot doing that. And I got to tell you, you can look at brands who do things, what you consider, what I would consider, you know, what I like and what I consider right. And I see other people doing something and you're always got to be doing your homework of like, Oh geez, I wouldn't have done that. Or, Oh, I like how Ron does the simplified, just very beautiful pictures, the attention to detail. I think in everything, you're just, we're all doing our homework all the time, scanning, seeing things and then, and then applying it to ourselves, but it's never copying really. It's just, no, of course not. No, it's, I mean, you know, what's that saying? Uh, Originality is the art of concealing your sources. Um, I, I, I buy into that in, on a certain level, but at the same time, um, you know, I've certainly been inspired by, things that have come before and have thought, you know, like the advent of the, of this new, uh, you know, wood metal hoop is a great example. It's like, well, you know, those hoops were done before in various iterations. Ray Ayotte came along and he did his wood hoop version, which was fantastic, but also had some problems. And I went, you know, I, I actually did a, a different version of that first and then finally made my way back to the, the to this, that sort of quote, hide a hoop version that he had done. And, hmm. Sometimes it just depends, I guess, you know, like literal, uh, uh, literal interpretations are, are not a big fan of that stuff. But yeah, if you, if you grow in your own funk, um, and I, or I've had something to do with it, that's great. Yeah. Which that's cool. And I mean, it's easy to feel, uh, for the people, if you're in your shoes or you see someone coming along, who's kind of competition it's easy to feel a little like oh geez but it's better to we're we're all in the community it's better to work together but if someone's blatantly copying or doing something wrong then that's the drum community usually jumps all over that and uh yeah we'll kind of speak out but so on that note ron the end the kind of you know where we're at now is when can people like expect to be seeing these and are you going to be like you know chicago drum show i imagine you'll probably have something there yeah, I'm. I'm like I said. The, the the only piece that I'm waiting for now is the uh, the badges, and mm-hmm. uh, I imagine that those are going to be arriving, you know, within the next few weeks. And uh, I'll be bringing a, at least a gold sparkle and a silver sparkle with me. They will be pre production prototypes of this model and this iteration. Like we've you know made some some priors, but but these are going to be the ones that really sort of um, people are going to be able to to judge it on. Sure. And then, um, you know, as, as we sit here, the, the, uh, the first run of a hundred, um, after the, after the pre-production ones that's being made right now. And, uh, and I don't mind sharing it. It's probably a, a best time. This founder's model, we're doing, um, you know, five and a half, six and a half and eight inch depths, and we're doing three finishes, silver sparkle, 
Gold Sparkle and Copper Sparkle. And those that will be a limited edition run. And we'll be doing, uh, or I'll be doing both eight and 10 lug versions because hmm. you know, um, I like eight lugs and some people like 10. And I figured, you know, why not? We'll just mix it up a little bit and uh, yeah. create, some, create some diversity and some collectability. So anytime I'll, I'll be uh, taking my usual, uh, you know, midsummer break and, and going back to the farm. So uh, I'll be putting out as much product as I can before I leave. And then, uh, you know, when I get back in September, that's when the big push will be on. And that's when you're going to start to see some really, really cool stuff. Not the least of which, and I'm happy to say this, you know, there's some, there's a new fiberglass hoop design that's in development. Oh, wow. And that I've always wanted to happen. And there is um, uh, a hybrid vibrofibed model hmm. in development. And I may actually even have that at the Chicago show. I just think that there was um, a lot of great ideas and a lot of potential, uh, you know, left, you know, I would, I would have loved to have seen what Michael would have done. Oh, and by the way, I want to mention this just out of time. The problem that Michael faced when he, he got a big, big squeeze that really impacted. And that's why he ended up closing the business. It wasn't that, Miles don't work make, weren't making great drums or anything like that. No, to the contrary. The problem was is that they were expensive to make at the time that he was making them. Hmm. And he got hit when the Canadian government decided that they were going to basically remove uh, tariffs and duties on imported drum kits. And so anybody knows, right around that time, there was a huge influx in the, uh, in the early 80s of you know, the Maxwin and the Pearl and the Baxter and all of the, yeah. you know, and that hit, that hit a lot of companies. Um, and, uh, that's sure that was the, uh, that was the meteorite that hit planet, uh, milestone and made it, uh, <laughs> and brought, and yeah. <laughs> brought it into the dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, so, that's so many brands though. I mean, that's like, I mean, no one really saw that coming until boom, all the like Japanese brands just, it, Wow. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and in, in, in the time, you know, in the 30, 40 years since since he stopped making drums, um, things have changed and, and, and industry has adapted and we all know how it works now. You know, yeah. we, we, uh, we, we all get our metal parts. 99% of them uh, are made over in Taiwan. And there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. because, um, and it's not because they work for 50 cents an hour. It's because they're good at doing it. Yeah, I remember you saying that in your episode about there's a uh, the previous George Way episode about there's a misconception about Taiwan or be it being this dirt cheap place to do stuff. I mean, you, you said they're state of the art factories and passionate workers, and it's just a more affordable way to get things though from from as opposed not, to manufacturing. Not even affordable. It's amazing quality. Yeah, it's amazing quality. Yeah, you know, I mean, hey, I I could get I I could get that lug done here, but if you want. Forty dollars a lug. <laughs> oh my God! You know, think that's your cost. It's like okay, so that means I got to sell one lug for eighty dollars, and I'm going to put ten of these on a drum. It's like it's just insane. It's not doable. I mean, it's not possible. It's, it's, it's not viable. It's not yeah. viable. Yeah. And, and yeah. So. Cool. Well, Ron, why don't you tell people? Um, the best way to keep up with you, I imagine social media or through a website. What, what, where do you want to direct people to keep up with Milestone or, you know, George Way or Danette in general? Yep, I've, I've, you know, just um, right now, I guess the best way is on Instagram. It's under Danette Classic Drums. And that's where I post, you know, all the George Way and Milestone stuff and just uh, sort of poured it all through that. Uh, my personal, um, uh, Facebook page, Ron Danette, uh, and of course, which has its limitations, but I've also created a Milestone Percussion Facebook page, and uh, both the domains, uh, milestone, uh, milestonepercussion.ca and .com, those are registered, and I'm working on the website. Um, God, I got so much to do. I was going to uh, say, <laughs> the website alone can be know, so right? time consuming. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah and trying to get someone to do it. It's like, oh my God. Is there is there any good web developers out there who really want to do it? Please send me an I, email because 
a friend made mine for free. I recorded. I worked on his album at work, and uh, he liked what I was doing, and just designed the whole website for me. And I'm not touching it ever again. It's, it's so time consuming, and it was free. It's so it's unbelievable. I, I paid a guy a thousand dollars to redo the Danette one. Yeah, that was uh, six months ago, and it's like, yeah, I have to prod every. Uh, it's like you know, it's annoying. I, it, it's it's just that's why my website is so dated but you know i'm fortunate that the you know the dealers that i work with um that's their job to stay on top of that a little yeah. bit um and uh yeah now and facebook is a great resource for this you know social media has its ups and downs but for finding information about a company uh and i'll put the link to all that in the description um but so Ron, uh, we talked about doing a little Patreon bonus episode, which we'll do after we finish this. But I'd like to talk to you uh, after we wrap up this one about maybe tips that you have for people who are builders, who are starting a drum brand, who are working with maybe shops. I just think someone like you has a lot of experience and can maybe give, you know, five or 10 minutes of just like your like this is some mistakes that I've made. This is some things that I've learned uh, for drum builders. I'm, if anybody's listening, all you drum builders and anybody who might want to do that, I'm going to give away all my secrets. <laughs> you got to pay two bucks a month. To sign though. up on the Patreon thing. I'm going to. I, I'm, it's, I'm going to tell everything. I have the book right here. That's great. All the dirty secrets. <laughs> It'd be great. <laughs> all right. So <laughs> yeah, if anyone wants to hear all of Ron's dirty secrets, uh, go to drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a Patreon button there. You can join up. Um, so. Yeah, Ron, again, thank you so much for doing this and taking the time to uh, to join me on really short notice. I mean, we kind of set this up a couple of days ago. Um, so thank you for being here, Ron. Thanks for everyone for listening. And I can't wait to see what you do with Milestone and uh, where you take it in the future. Yep, you're going to love it.